www.pete.com. Hi, I'm Pete Leeson, and um, I first got into uh, the idea of limited government through being interested in supply-side economics. Uh, and from there, I sort of got interested in Austrian economics, and that broadened my interest in liberty more generally because of the, the often compatibility between Austrian ideas and, and uh, freedom. And from there, I kind of got interested into public choice economics, which was kind of a cool combination because on the one hand what I got from Austrian economics were these ideas about how important the market is for civil society and for generating economic wealth. And on the other hand, I got these great set of ideas from public choice economics about why it was that government oftentimes, rather than being able to facilitate the ability of the market to function better, in fact made people worse off. And it was the kind of concatenation of those ideas that ultimately led me to the idea of anarchy. Um, and that along with, of course, the ideas of Murray Rothbard and others who had written in the tradition of, of anarcho-capitalism. But I try, try and view anarchy from consequentialist, uh, a co consequentialist perspective. And it just seems that overwhelmingly government simply isn't able to improve upon the outcomes of the market. And so for those reasons, I was led to this, this notion of anarcho-capitalism. And that kind of spawned an interest in a lot of the research that I engage in today as an economist. Uh, in terms of scientific economics. One of the things that I think it's really important for those who are interested in anarchy and in fact those who are interested in using government to better society is this idea of comparing apples and apples as opposed to apples and oranges. A lot of times what people do when they look at anarchy in say a place like Somalia which is obviously an extremely poor, in fact one of the poorest countries in the world, it has lots and lots of problems. What they want to do is to then conclude necessarily from that that anarchy must be an inferior political economic arrangement. But that comparison implicitly is comparing an apple to an orange. The orange in this case, typically what the critic has in their mind, is something like a well-functioning Western democratic government such as we have in the United States or what we might observe in Western Europe. But that's kind of an absurd um, comparison, or at least an inappropriate one in many ways. Unless, in fact, Somalia, for example, has as one of its feasible political economic opportunity sets, you know, one of the, avail one of the institutional uh, alternatives available to it, a kind of government such as the one that we observe in the United States, then that's not a relevant comparison to make at all. It rather might be, in fact, that Somalia, under anarchy, which is not a well-functioning anarchy, but it might be that that compared to the type of government that, say, Somalia would alternatively have, realistically, such as the highly predatory government that it suffered under before government collapsed in Somalia in 1991, that when you make a comparison like that, apples to apples, what are the realistic alternatives available in this particular situation, that in fact anarchy turns out to be better. Now this isn't something that we know a priori, we have to do it on an empirical basis, uh, and some of my research actually examined this in the case of Somalia. I looked at welfare indicators in Somalia, all of those that were available at the time, before and after Somalia's government collapsed. And I asked, well, how has Somalia fared under anarchy? And it turns out that in almost all of the welfare indicators available, Somalia, surprisingly, perhaps for many anyway, has fared uh, much, much better than it did under government. That's not a testament, again, to the great wonderland that is uh, uh, anarchy in Somalia. It's rather a testament to just how bad government is when it's really, really predatory, something that I referred, what I mentioned to before. So it again connects back to this idea that it's not so much that statelessness is necessarily Disneyland as much as it is, as it is that the relevant alternative, uh, which is typically predatory government in the, in the, the developing world, is really, really bad. Uh, and so it's important to bear in mind comparing apples and apples. And the same thing is true when you want to think about anarchy in the developed world. It wouldn't make sense, for example, to compare, again, the, would we like to have uh, Somalia's anarchy in the United States or would we like to live in, a, in, in the United States that occur, as it currently exists with government? If somebody gave me that choice, I would certainly pick the United States with government. I think that that's a no-brainer. Some people might disagree, but that's my consequentialist perspective anyway. But the important thing to recognize in this case is that if we were to have something like statelessness in the U.S., it would probably not look like statelessness in Somalia. The reason is that Somalia has very particular historical and very particular con contextual reasons why its anarchy is what I call a worst case anarchy, uh, tends to be a very ineffective anarchy. The United States in many ways has higher what economists call civic capital. We have much greater t trust, for example. We have a more developed set of norms that are oftentimes conducive to property rights protection and economic development. Those things suggest to me anyway that if we were to have something like statelessness in the United States, that would look like a lot much close, something closer to a first best type of anarchy one that would work a lot better than we see in Somalia. So one of the things that I take away that I try to do in my research is to encourage people to then actually use reasonable and relevant comparisons as opposed to 
pulling things out of their rear, so to speak, and comparing them to things that are not, in fact, opportunities. Most recently, I've been interested in research associated with 18th century pirates. And part of the reason that pirates fascinated me was because they were an outlaw community. And that outlaw community, of course, couldn't rely on government to create cooperation within it. So necessarily, they had to be relying on some, some kind of set of private institutions to facilitate social order, which meant that they were operating in an, anar in an anarchic environment. And so I got interested in what particular sorts of private institutions were able to facilitate order among pirates. And it turns out that they had an incredibly sophisticated system of constitutional democracy, for example. All of this happened, again, without any government intervention, without any kind of central planning. And so if you can have among a set of unruly thieves these themes of sophisticated, spontaneous order, these private institutions that are highly effective, then it struck me, it seems that they are extremely robust. That is that if they can work among pirate communities, then why can't they also work among communities of legitimate individuals? And I think that they can.